not. We'll see. It's it's always rough the first time that we do something starting back after Easter when we have one of these big breaks like this. Um, so I wanted to start out by just giving a little bit of background uh, to the book of Acts and why we're doing this as our Easter Bible study. Um, we're doing this as our Easter Bible study because people had sort of all along expressed interest in sort of more uh, either thematic or book and not just sort of sit down and, and read something. And so we're not going to read the entire book of Acts. It's long. It would go long after the, the season of Easter, but we'll sort of plop our way through um, uh, the, the entirety of the book. So, so we'll, we'll get most of it. There's some pretty long speeches by Peter that we can pick and choose from. But the book of Acts was written around the same time as the Gospel of Luke. So in scholarly research, we often reference Luke Acts. It's sort of as one thing. Luke dash Acts is one thing because there is the um, inference and assumption. Um, and by this point, just sort of, it's taken as a given that they have the same author um, or at least that they're intended for the same community. So uh, as we know, the actual authors of the four gospels and frankly of a number of the books of the New Testament, um, we don't specifically know who wrote them uh, we know what communities they were intended for, and often they got the name attributed to the creator of that community. So that uh, the idea that John, the beloved disciple, was still alive to write the Gospel of John in well into the second century, probably not, but the community of John is the one that was intended for it and put it together very likely from the oral teachings of that, you know, of, of the original founder. It's a little different when we talk about like Luke Acts because it's a little bit earlier, Mark, you know, at Mark Paul, uh, sort of the earlier you go, the closer to the ability that someone's probably still alive, uh, the better. But Luke Acts is one uh, sort of unit. Uh, together, Luke and Acts, one author, is over a quarter of the New Testament. It is the most um, text, it is the most story, it is the most content attributed to a single author in the entire New Testament at about 27% or so. Um, so it, it's chunky, right? Luke is the longest gospel. And then when you add in Acts, which is equally as long, you're looking at a lot. That being said, Acts stands alone in the genre of the New Testament. So uh, so if we think of the Bible as a library, there's a bunch of different genres, everything from fiction to biography, to history, to prophecy, to poetry, to, you know, um, uh, music, everything's in, in there. Acts stands alone in the New Testament as being history. So the gospels, while historical, have a different sense of history because they are these, um, when, when we talk about the style of, of genre of the time, they're more hero stories, right? They're, they're more religious texts. They're about uh, a, a divinity come to earth, right? All, all of these sorts of things. Acts is a little different in that it is the history of the early church. It is the pickup of the story of what happens basically between the ascension and when Paul's letters pick up. They sort of fill in that gap. What happens immediately after Jesus's feet leave earth and the church is left to be the church. Um, and so Acts becomes really history and that genre is, is unique to this book. It's a chunky text. Um, I always, though, like to think that as long as the book of Acts is, it really should have been printed with a whole bunch of extra pages. Um, one of my professors in seminary used to say that everything after the book of Acts should be blank pages for us to put our own stories on, because that's really sort of where our story picks up. 
the the letters of Paul come after Acts in the Bible because that's how we decided to put the library together. But it, that's not chronologically how it happens. Acts is sort of the last part of the story, but we've added, but then sort of we pick up and tell the rest of the story. So that Acts is really the, the story of the early church, sort of what does it mean to be Easter people? There's more and more conversations in the world today, um, and certainly in the ELCA, there's lots out right now about really the fact that we are, put, we have a lot to learn from the book of Acts on how to be church, not just from a faith perspective, but from a practical perspective. Because, as you may have seen in recent news, you know, for the first time in history, Christianity is not the predominant religion um, in the United States, I would argue around the world, um, that, that it's not the majority religion. We are not, we cannot just assume things. I said this a few years ago, I know uh, some folks um, had some issues at the time, but sort of we're looking at the decline of Christendom, not Christianity, Christendom, right? The, the, the idea that Christianity is the predominant ruling um, assumed religion um, is on the decline. And we can look at that as a bad thing as, oh, what's going to happen when we can't assume, you know, that everybody's Christian, when we can't assume, you know, things when, when we're not in sort of the majority, we can look at that as a bad thing, or we could look at it as a good thing and say, but this continues to give us opportunity to, uh, to be church in ways that we have seen before, that we have these examples before. Um, one of my professors in seminary used to say that the church is always at her best when under persecution. Now, I don't think persecution is what we're looking for right now, but the idea that we really have to show off who we are because you can't assume people know the story isn't a bad thing. And so it gives us these opportunities. And so Acts in this Easter season really is the story of what does the church do on this side of resurrection? Even more so, this is why uh, you may have noticed, uh, liturgically speaking, during the Easter season, uh, we do not have readings from the Old Testament in worship. So where we normally have an Old Testament reading, a, a Psalm, a New Testament reading, uh, and a gospel, we have a reading from Acts, a Psalm, a, re a, a New Testament reading, and then uh, a gospel, specifically because in this season, we are kind of talking about who we are. What does it mean on this side of the resurrection? So that's what we're looking at. A book written, so, so, with, the, so, so with, with Acts, we're looking at a book written in tandem with the Gospel of Luke, somewhere between 80 and 110 AD, we're not quite sure, um, that is intended for an audience of Gentiles, of already converted Gentiles. This is not a, this is not a, for conversion. This is for a group that needs these texts. Probably pretty well educated. It's a lengthy book. There's, uh, Luke is the gospel of the parables. So there's a lot of some, some mystery language. Um, you know, in, in sort of the Greek speaking part of the Roman empire of the time. So that, that's what we know about the gospel, the, the, the text of Acts itself. Um, Pastor? Yes. Mm -hmm. I covered this before I got here, but- No worries. Is it the same author? So it is assumed to be the same author because of how it begins. Mm -hmm. So if you read, and I know I didn't include it in the packet that I sent, uh, sent out, but if you read the first lines of Luke, which we never read, um, but the first line of Luke is, since many have, have undertaken to set down an orderly account of the events that have been fulfilled among us, in other words, several people have tried to write a gospel, just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, I too decided after investigating everything carefully from the very first to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so mm -hmm. that you may know the truth concerning the things about which you have been instructed. In the days of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. So where, you know, we, we get in John, the great prologue of in the beginning was the word. In Mark, it starts out the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. 
Uh, Matthew starts out with the genealogy, right? The, the 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations from, uh, from Adam to Jesus. Luke starts out with this little beginning, basically that makes it seem like this entire book was meant to be written, was meant to be read aloud, but was being sent through a specific person. Now, here's the thing, Theophilus, because as you may have already looked at, the, the book of Acts starts out with, in the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all the things that Jesus did and taught um, until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen after uh, this, right? And so now we get this sort of where we picked up, right? right. Last time on. Uh, like, like last time on the story of Jesus and, and his community, Meanwhile, back we heard the- about this, right? And now, now I'm going to pick up here. And so for that reason, we, we assume it's, it's picked up. We can assume several things about the intended audience. As I said, Greek, well, Greek speaking, uh, relatively educated Christian converts, uh, probably Gentile. However, also this sort of public reading of this text probably with the assumption that it would be during a communion worship service because Luke has a particularly specific uh, in, in the gospel of Luke, there's this particularly specific last supper narrative uh, of Luke. And because of several different points that are made throughout both of the texts that reflect liturgy itself. And we'll talk about some of those. Um, so we assume the same author and we assume the age of the book sort of sort of 80 to 110 for several reasons one because we know that luke like matthew uses mark as a source so so i i could show you the whole chart and perhaps you've seen it before but mark matthew and luke are the synoptic gospels they share a lot in common mark we know is the first just from dating of the texts. Mark is first, probably very shortly after the second, uh, the fall of the second temple. So right around sort of the the 80 AD. Um, There are things that Matthew and Luke clearly get from Mark because they all tell the same story, largely the same way. Things like the feeding of the 5,000 that show up in all the gospels. Um, There's also a, Q source, which is sort of the sayings of Jesus, which Matthew and Luke use because they share some parables in common that Mark doesn't have. And then there's things called special M and special L, which are things that are unique to Matthew and Luke. It's a whole chart. Ask Dr. Hall about, you know, ask Crystal Hall about it sometime. I'm sure she can draw you the whole chart and tell you much more recent uh, scholarship on that sort of stuff. However, um, because of the things we know that we that, that Luke gets from Mark and that Mark is a source, we know it has to be after Mark. And Mark was sort of somewhere in the 78 to 80 period. And also because the, as we'll talk about in Acts, there is this assumption in Luke that he has been traveling somewhat with Paul although he doesn't reference the letters of Paul. So it, it's probably pretty contemporaneous with, um, with Paul. Um, he doesn't, and, and what I mean by that is that he talks about Paul, he tells the story of Paul, and as we'll look at, and I've talked about before, there's some points in the text where he starts talking about we, and so it's assumed that Luke goes on the journey with Paul, but at no point does he really share any of the teachings of Paul, and so there, does, he assume, hmm? does he assume then that they've read the letters of Paul, probably, or that? Well, so whether or not he assumes they read the letters of Paul, what's clear is that he only has himself a certain amount of knowledge. So, so it's not necessarily that he assumes they read the letters of Paul; it's that the letters of Paul are being written and distributed and sort of spread more widely than that sort of contemporaneous with this. And so either he doesn't know about them uh, because he hasn't received them yet or because they're being distributed. And so he figures you have, you're getting all these things together. Um, I mean, the other thing for us to remember is that all of these texts were written with a specific community in mind, uh, which means that this wasn't a, 
I'm going to write this gospel and we'll print up 1500 versions of it and print it to every church. This was, I'm writing for a community that may or may not itself then share it more widely. Certainly we know oral culture and written culture sort of bleed together during this period. Um, but we're, we're not we're not looking at someone that's sort of sitting there and handwriting 15 copies of this. This is one copy being written for a community that then may or may not share the entire thing or pieces of it, which is again, how we get different things out of it. We know things about the Luke Acts, but more, more so Luke, um, about style, right? It's certainly more colorful. There's a lot more descriptions of things. We know that Luke is the favorite of people like Marcion and Thomas Jefferson because they prefer sort of the earthiness of Jesus in these and the social justice aspect of, of Luke's texts. All right, Luke, Luke is the sort of social justice gospel. Luke mentions women more than anybody else uh, in both the gospel of Luke and Acts. And all of that sort of makes him very popular with people that like the more moralistic Jesus than the sort of divine miracle working Jesus. So that, that you know, that's what I have. Uh, what I was gonna say, the last, the last point is this sort of mysterious Theophilus. Who is Theophilus? Mm, could be that it was someone named Theophilus, which by the way, translates as friend, uh, so, so, sort of the um, gender inclusive version is friend of God. Um, in technicality, it's brother of God, uh, right? Philo is, is if you think about Philadelphia is is Phila is um, uh, love right um, and brotherly love, um, but friend, lover, companion of God is sort of Theophilus because Theo is is God. So it could be that there was someone named Theophilus. On the other hand, the idea that it's probably just uh, the title given to dear person who is reading this, who by virtue of being part of the Christian community is a friend of God, or a, an affectionate name that Luke has for a friend that he's writing this to that's a member of that community. You know, there's a big question mark around who this Theophilus is. In the end, doesn't really matter specifically who this person is, um, except to say that it is this idea of building that community part, right? That, that idea of friend of God, right? I, I think it's a great way to call someone, right? It, it's like, you know, I, I often, someone will text me, I'm like, oh, hi, how, how are you, friend, right? Um, it, 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 it's sort, sort of that sort of affectionate name within the community of, of the beloved. But as I said, this was clearly meant to be written um, as part of uh, worship. And we will see that at several points, but particularly when we look to people like Justin Martyr, who talks about the early church, it talks about, we read, we, we read um, the prophets, we read, and we read the memoirs of the apostles, which is potentially letters of Paul, potentially uh, gospel uh, texts, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or one of the other gospels written of the time, or probably a lot of it was this chunk from Acts, right? This, this sort of remembering what has happened that has gotten us this far. Um, so that's sort of, sort of the intro to Acts itself. I know that wasn't particularly uh, read from the Bible, but I thought that it was important for us to sort of get this very unique text. When, when it comes to the entire text of the Bible, but particularly New Testament, Acts does stand alone in its genre and style. Um, so I wanted us to get a little background there. Before we start reading, are there questions there on some of the background and history of the text itself? If not, would someone like to uh, read uh, 1, 1 through 14? Oh, you'll have to unmute yourself, though. Okay, I'll read it. 1 to 14, is that? Okay. Yes. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
To them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he char charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Oliver, Olivet, <laughs> which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these with one accord devoted themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. So, in, so, so the interesting thing here is we know that Luke acts while thought of as one text because of its authorship and its uh, intention was not probably sent all in one, right? Why? Because that's a lengthy retelling of exactly what happens at the end of the Gospel of Luke. So, so, so the author actually tells the story twice. And that's why I say really this beginning part of this text, uh, one through 14 is really this, if you remember last time, and if you happen to have put down the book and misplaced it on the shelf, let me catch up with what happened. Last time on the saga of Jesus and his community, here's what happened, right? Jesus was teaching them, told them to stay in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit, ascends into heaven, I, the the two men show up. Why are you looking? Um, he will come as he went, and they stayed in Jerusalem. Now, a couple of specific things I want to point out about this: uh, Mount Olivet is not the same as the Mount of Olives, because um, those are a little <laughs> that's a little closer to Jerusalem. Um, and we know Mount of Olives is called one that right, and so we have different names. Uh, but this idea of a Sabbath day's journey away is. I was going to Only ask, a, what does that mean? Yeah. So a Sabbath day's journey means uh, in the prescription, in the law, and I could look it up if I really uh, was interested. It uh, doesn't super matter. The point is uh, we know that there's the commandment to rest on the Sabbath and lots of work that wasn't allowed to be done, right? So you you could feed your animal, but you couldn't untie your animals. You didn't untie them there before. Um, you know, you could... Uh, pour water, but you couldn't draw water, right? There, there were all these distinctions about what counted as work on the Sabbath. In the same way, there was a length that someone was able to travel on the Sabbath itself that was much shorter, um, that would, over that would be considered work, under that would be considered not as much. So it's, I, I think last I checked, it was somewhere like two miles max. Um, but but the idea being, it was a bit of a distance uh, from Jerusalem, but still overlooking Jerusalem. So so just the there they didn't go far, uh, so that they were able to get back in. Why is this important that it's a Sabbath day's journey? Uh, because of the 
day and the time and a little bit of this confusion about um, time in Luke. So Luke, in Luke's telling of the resurrection, Jesus rises early in the morning, goes for breakfast, appears to a bunch of people, and then ascends by sundown. So that the resurrection and the ascension all happen on one day in Luke. Je Jesus, Jesus rises from the dead and rises into heaven all on one day. Um, and so a little bit because we have this early on the first day of the week, immediately after Sabbath time issues, we, we need to be clear about how far these people are walking. You look confused. Yeah, Luke does a bunch of interesting things. Luke also has two cups at the Last Supper. Uh, Jesus offers wine, then bread, then wine, which is why I like to think, uh, at least according to Luke, uh, the Last Supper was not a Seder, it was a symposium, because that follows the symposium model uh, of the Greco-Roman world, which would have been probably far more familiar to Hellenistic Jews uh, than the Seder itself. And fits the model of why Jesus does so much teaching at the Last Supper, because that would have been more a symposium. Um, and there's a great book on that, uh, uh, Eating in Luke or something. Uh, great, all, all about communion in Luke. Um, so so that, that's what we have here. We also have this list of disciples, which maps on mostly with the uh, disciples that we get in Luke uh, that, that are called as sort of this inner circle of a followers. Um, I, we should note that Judas here is not Judas, that, that's Jude, that that's, uh, has now sort of become known as Jude Thaddeus, um, sort of Jude-Thaddeus. We've given him a hyphenated name, which is super not what his name really was. <laughs> but in order to sort of streamline um, uh, all the versions of the disciples, Jude Thaddeus is one, and Nathaniel Bartholomew is one. Uh, so so th that's actually Jude Thaddeus. That is not Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. So I think that's important for us to realize. Um, and we should take note in the text of when they start being called apostles versus disciples, because they are called disciples in the Gospel of Luke. And quickly will start being called apostles. Um, and the reminder there of the difference between ones who sit and listen, that's a disciple, ones who learn, uh, sort of disciple being a student, an apostle literally translated as one who is sent. Um, and so the difference between those who learn and those who are sent, but it's the same list of people. Um, and that, that, that language that we get, that, that shift from disciples to apostles happens most clearly in Luke because it's one person writing the story. Um, and so for us to, to realize where that happens in the text. Are there questions on one through 14? Does someone want to read the end, uh, the end of chapter one? So that is 15 through 26. Okay, I'll re <clears throat> read it and I find it here. Okay. Oops. During those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the brothers. There was a group of about 120 persons in the one place. He said, my brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who was the guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was numbered among us and was allotted a share in this ministry. He bought a parcel of land with the wages of his iniquity and falling, head, falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his insides spilled out. This became known to everyone who lived in Jerusalem so that the parcel of land was called in their language, al Qaedama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his encampment become desolate and may no one dwell in it. How far? How far to uh, go? 26. So, so just finish our chapter one. And <clears throat> may another take his office. Therefore, it is necessary that one of the men who accompanied us the whole time the Lord Jesus came and went among us. 
beginning from the baptism of John until the day on which he was taken up from us, become with us a witness to his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph called Bersabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, you Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic ministry from which Judas turned away to go to his own place. Then they gave lots to them and the lot fell upon Matthias and he was counted with the 11 apostles. So we have apostles now, this is wonderful. Um, so this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I've talked about this before, so I won't go a lot into the casting of lots we don't know exactly what lots were, but I've said before, it was sort of like drawing straws and rolling dice and playing cards with a little bit of like tarot and astrology thrown in. Uh, but the idea that we can tell casting lots happens often. Casting lots, once we hit acts and later texts of Christianity, casting lots has the inference for the reader of, and we left it up to God. It was the way for us to understand who God wanted um, because of the idea that we're going to say, hey, God, we think someone should be picked between these two. We don't know which one. So we're going to pick a name out of a hat. We're going to draw straws. <laughs> and so you should sort of be in that process so that we know um, who, who's in it. And so that's when, when, when we see casting lots, especially in the life of the church, it's sort of this, we're leaving it up to God. Yep. Didn't they cast lot for Jesus's clothes when he was crucified? Or is this that- is why I say, I, I was say, this is why I say, this is why I say, starting with the book of Acts when we read okay. it. So, 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 so there are a few points where you hear about casting lots. It obviously shows up in uh, the Psalms we know because it's referenced in the gospels as being fulfillment of scripture. Um, but, what we get from that is this is a Hellenistic Roman um, game that was played, a game of chance. That, 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 that's why I say it's more than drawing straws. It's also like rolling dice, playing cards, Any, anything that's sort of a game of chance that you don't know the outcome. Like gambling. Right. And in the case of Jesus' clothes, it was gambling because there was a prize. It would have been sort of though, in this case is like, well, we don't know how else to do this. And so we're leaving it up to, basically we're leaving it up to chance. You know, what, what sort of the phrase we would say now is we're leaving it up to chance, but the idea that there was something divine in that process um, is sort of what, what we understand for the, for the church. What I think is really fascinating and what I want us, what I always think we should remember is this idea, you know, of who are the disciples, who are, the, who is the beloved community, who is Jesus talking to, even when it says that Jesus meets with the disciples, right? The the text, and particularly Luke, but but the text gets specific when they talk about Jesus and the twelve, and Jesus and his disciples, and how do, and how do we know that there were other people? Well, because especially according to Luke, women are always around. You know, and so they're always part of the community. And here we have this idea that there are some who were part of the inner circle, even, of disciples, but just not part of the 12, of which we have at least two, right? So so we have Joseph Barsabbas, uh, Justice, uh, you know, so, so we, we have Justice and we have Matthias. I love the question of what happened to Justice after this. Did he sort of mope away did he stay part of the group right how how much would that what 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 did it do to justice that we end up with this oh but but not you maybe you not you um but but i you know i think this is just one of those great stories and i think as always it's this little bit it's the first time that the church decided that we've always done it that way so we have to keep doing it that way um, because there is nothing anywhere that Jesus says there has to be 12, but there always had been 12. So we have to have 12. We don't have 12 anymore. So now we have to have 12, right? And so it's the first time that the church said, we've always done it that way. So we should keep doing it. Uh, fine, whatever. So it's part of precedent. 
well. Uh, and 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 here we're talking about like day after Easter, right? So 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 that that's the other thing is, you know, I think when we when we think about the church year and the fact that Ascension falls forty days after Easter, and we think of this as after the Ascension, so we think that we're talking about like right around Pentecost time. So we're talking about some time has passed. In Luke, because everything happens on one day, we're talking about like Easter Monday. We're picking a new disciple. So Judas betrays on Thursday night into Friday. At some point on Friday, hangs himself. And I'll get into that in a second. Jesus dies, is raised. We pick a new disciple, right? I mean, so so like it, it, it it's not as long of a period as we think it is, at least according to Luke. What's interesting to me is we get a different story of Judas. So we don't honestly know what happened to Judas. Matthew is the only gospel that says Judas went out and hung himself, right? He's so overcome with grief that he goes out and hangs himself. The other text, Judas is regretful, but we don't really get what, what happens in the story. In Luke's version, we don't get, we get nothing in the gospel, but in Acts now, he uh, burst open in the middle and everything gushed out in a feet, right? All these sort of very descriptive, <laughs> thank you, Martha, for reading them. Um, <laughs> of of what happened um, with this, right? And so in this text, Judas is much more of a villain, right? Because what we get from all the texts is that Judas goes, in, in some of the gospels, Judas goes to return the coins, right? Return the 30 pieces of silver. So he doesn't end up getting paid. And the Sanhedrin, the Jewish authorities say, well, we might as well buy a plot of land, which is then known as a potter's field or a pauper's grave, right? So, so it's, it's sort of unusable land uh, where sort of those who couldn't afford or were outsiders could be buried, right? Potter's field. Um, and that's how the field gets acquired. That's how it gets its name, which is a very different name. Um, in this text, Judas like gets this money and buys a field, and then he's so overcome with, with grief that he like throws himself in the field and ends up disemboweled all over it, and that's why it's called Field of Blood. It's a very colorful story. I mean, that's the thing about Luke. He definitely gives the color commentary of, of really the whole story, um, but it's a very different story. It's also particularly interesting that the two Psalms that he quotes, so, so anytime that someone says, according to David, that means the Psalms. But the two Psalms he picks are not cheery Psalms. Uh, one of them is a song of lament. So uh, this idea of um, let another, so, so the first text, the, the first text of let his home homestead be desolate and let there be no one to live in it, um, which by the way, makes a singular out of a plural. Um, but that's the but that's from Psalm 69, which starts out, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck, I sink in deep mire. So, so it's this uh, real despair. Um, and so it's seen as this description of someone who's despairing, which is a little bit generous to Judas. However, the second text here, the let another take his position of overseer, comes from Psalm 109, which starts out, do not be silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are opened again, right? And so they're not, we're, we're really turning Judas into the villain uh, in, the, in the text of Acts, which I always have a, I always think that Judas gets a bad rap uh, for what he's done. I think in some ways he did a very honest uh, and human thing in not really understanding enough, um, realizing Jesus is going further than he's comfortable with. To the extent that he does, that's a whole other story. Um, but, but so that's sort of where we have there with that um, appointment of Matthias as the 12th apostle. Um, are there questions on the end of chapter one? Seeing none, um, I, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, Can yeah. I ask a, a question about the number Please. 11? Um, was there a history uh, prior to this of the number 11 being considered incomplete or imperfect? Uh, or is it just because it's one short of the 12 that we, that, that we have come down with that sense of the number 11? So I 
don't do a lot with numerology. I don't know that there's a lot to do with that. I mean, we we have we have bigger biblical numbers, right? So we end up with biblical numbers of three, four, uh, three, four, five, seven, seven, eight, right? right? Um, so sort of six, uh, and and as we heard from Dr. Hall. Uh, in the fall, six being the ultimate sign of imperfection because it's oh. one short of a full week, right? So, so seven being this really holy number because it's the week, it, it's the days of creation. Six is everything but seven, right? Mm-hmm. Which is why six 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 becomes this idea of sort yeah. of the mark of the beast, right? Because because now, now we're like triply imperfect. And eight being the ultimate perfection as sort of the, the ultimate day of the perfection of creation. 11, 12, I, we get 12 as a number because, uh, you know, and a lot has been said, a lot of ink has been spilled on sort of the idea that there were 12 disciples because there were 12 tribes, because there were, right, and all these things around 12 that I don't know that Jesus was really thinking about. Right. I really think Jesus happened to stumble across enough people that came and <laughs> choose, right? Peter and Andrew are brothers. James and John are brothers. Uh, Philip has a friend, Nathaniel, right? And it's a good number for a symposium. Right? Yeah. I mean, so 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 if, if you think about triclinians, so, so um, right. dining rooms in, in ancient Rome were, had no table. Uh, it was three couches along three walls of an open fronted room. Uh, and so you would have three couches, each of which would have four people with Jesus in the middle, right? So everyone's laying down on your right arm, eating with your left, or no, laying on your left arm, eating with your right hand. Hopefully. Um, yeah, I, I, I had to remember how, how, how all the pictures are. Uh, so leaning on your left arm, but you, you're laid out, which is why in the texts, we get the idea of the one who reclined in the bosom of Jesus, because literally they were laying down, and, and, and that's that, that's from a different, by the way, that's from a different gospel than Luke, and so now we have two references to the idea that people were laying down mm-hmm. at the Last Supper. I just think it's a, I just, I think there's so much evidence that it was a symposium, and as a class, like as a classics major, I just, mm-hmm. um, but okay. anyway, uh, but but yeah. So I don't I okay. don't know that there ever was, and I feel like if it was that big a deal, Jesus does a lot of teaching, right? Because if we think about Luke, Luke is the gospel of these are you know we, we just heard on Sunday. The, you know I have taught you many things. These are the things of which you have been witnesses. Jesus walks the whole way to Emmaus with uh, Cleo, Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas. Um, right, all these things that Jesus teaches, I feel like at some point he would say, stay here in Jerusalem and while you're waiting for the Holy Spirit, maybe fill that gap, right? I feel like we would have gotten a little bit more of a charge from mm-hmm. Jesus. Instead, the charge comes from Peter. It's the first time that Peter really takes this leadership role in the church of saying, hey all, <laughs> we should do this. And everybody sort of falls in line. But again, I think I tend towards the idea that it's more the comfort of there have always been 12, we think it should be 12, um, than that there's any real sort of numerology behind it. Um, I think, I, I think honestly, a lot of our numerology is added later, um, so, so, sort of because of the history that arises from the text right. into Judeo-Christianity. I think we then read back in a lot of these meanings, right? Nowhere does it say that the number seven is the perfect number, but over time we went, well, but if that's how long it took to make all of creation, seems like a pretty good number to me, right? And so I think we're a little bit more in that category. But thank you, Tom, uh, for that, because I think that's important. Thank you, I I like your response, thank you. Yeah. I'm gonna read the, the very beginning here of two we're actually going to stop short of the end of two, so we'll pick up with the rest of two. But I just want to leave us with, with a question as we think about, and we'll pick up uh, for next week. So, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them.
All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this time, or, and at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galilean? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. We're going to stop us here, short of Peter's response, because Peter's response now goes on for like the next 150 chapters. Um, and just with a few things for us to think about. First, on a historical level, uh, Christians do not have ownership of Pentecost. Pentecost, uh, Penta, 50, uh, Pentecost, the 50th day after the Passover, was the Feast of the Harvest. And so we get the idea that Pentecost is 50 days after Easter, because we largely make Easter weekend fall somewhere close to Passover. And so we sort of take it ourselves as, as the 50th day of Easter. But it is a Jewish festival still celebrated sort of as this day of harvest, which is very interesting, you know, it, it's sort, sort of this, this interesting. Uh, yes. And so we have this um, interesting thing for us to realize is that Luke doesn't have to, Luke isn't saying, oh, and this feast day of the church gets started and we should call it Pentecost. What Luke is saying is that day, 50 days after Passover, 50 days later, the day of Pentecost would have been a phrase that people would have known. Um, as sort of this Judeo area. Now, again, these people reading this are uh, Gentile Christians, so it's not that they would have celebrated, but they would have had some sense of what was going on on this day. So, so that's why it's sort of this matter of fact, on the day of Pentecost, this thing happened. It's not that this thing happened, and so we call it Pentecost. It, it's, it's a dating uh, period for this, first. Second, there's no dove. Every depiction that I have seen of the Pentecost uh, ends up with like a dove like shooting out fire. Now, either it's the dove that sort of is has like fire coming out of its tail, or the more popular version is the dive bombing dove, right? The dove that's coming beak first like a fighter pilot, like spraying fire out at the disciples. There's no dove in this text. There's wind, violent wind. But the interesting thing is, I'm not even sure that there is, there's a sound like the rush of a violent wind. Now, how do you get that sound without the wind? I don't know. And I frankly think wind is a great word because wind breath spirit pneuma is is the word all are related um but I, I think that's really beautiful and then we have this idea of divided tongues as of fire and i think what's really beautiful about this idea is that i do love some of the most beautiful versions of pentecost that i have seen are usually one flame that sort of swirls out onto the disciples because it's not that everybody got their own little like flick a bick on top. Like, like it, it wasn't like everybody got their own little match on top of their head. It was this idea that sort of this fire filled the room and divided onto the apostles, right? And so these, these are things we get from the text. I don't know why I sometimes get on my high horse of trying to prove every depiction of things wrong, like my high horse about the fact that there were more than three magi. Um, but th this is one of those, because I, because I think it's so beautiful for us to think about, you know, I, I just think, and I know I preached on this last year, I feel like we just always have such a clean 
version of Pentecost. And I think Pentecost was very messy. Um, but then I have a question and I want, and, and I'll leave us with this and we can talk about it or pick it up next week, but something for us to think about. Where is the miracle of Pentecost? So in, in verse four, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability, which implies that the miracle of Pentecost is in the mouth of the apostle, right? So, so let, let's take one apostle, get some fire, speaks in a language. Another language besides Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek, which would have been sort of a native language of these people. Um, which is why, by the way, it's interesting that like Greece is not listed as one of the countries. There would have been Greeks, but Greek would have been a native language. Greek, Greek would have been the language of business, at least in Jerusalem. Um, and so there, there's the implication of, uh, of the miracle is in that it, it transforms the words coming out of the mouth, right? It's glossolalia or the gift of tongues um, that, that, that they were to speak in tongues. And certainly our Pentecostal siblings, that's what they see still as a, a evidence of the spirit is that you speak in tongues, a language that is known only between you and God, which, and we can talk about this later, uh, is very anti-scriptural. Uh, Paul talks about tongues as a gift paired with translation as a gift. It's why whenever we have music or language in church, that's in a, another language, whether it's Latin or whatever, Spanish, we also have the English next to it, right? The, it, it's, it's fine for us to have languages that people can't understand readily, but you need to put the translation. So anyway, uh, verse, verse five makes it seem like the, the gift is that the apostles are speaking in tongues. However, verse 11, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power, which seems to imply that the gift of Pentecost is in the ears of the hearers, that it's not that the disciples are speaking a foreign language, it's that people are able to understand what is a foreign language um, to them, right? So, so that Cretans and Arabs who would speak Arabic or Cretan I guess, um, understand the Hebrew, Aramaic, Aramaic or Greek that the disciples are speaking. I think though, for me, you know, so, so, so we have, we have some, some of these competing things, right? For me, the miracle of Pentecost is between the mouth and the ears, there's translation, there's understanding. Um, and I think that for us to think, particularly when we hear the ideas that, that um, this idea of filling the spirit, the, 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 the presence of the spirit is known by uh, rushing wind, uh, divided tongues. I think there's a lot more for us to think about in the gap than whether it was them speaking or hearing. That part doesn't matter. The point is that when one spoke, someone from a different country could understand it. And that's the thing for us to, to consider. And so I think that we can still have the question of where's the miracle of Pentecost, whether it's in the tongue or the ears or both or neither uh, and in the space between them. But I think something for us to think about because I think we often get sort of focused on the language part because let's face it, it's fun. And I'm sure many of us have been part of a church service where they decided to have a bunch of people pull out whatever language they learned in high school and try to fumble through biblical translation of a language which is never easy uh, talk to sarah calderon about trying to read biblical spanish it is not uh actual spanish um uh and and so we, we've all heard that on pentecost everybody you know we're, we're all going to pull out that you know that that high school primer and read at least a couple verses um and i think we get really focused on that part without sort of sitting down and saying but the point is that everybody could understand each other and that's what this is because what we will, and we'll talk more about this next week when we talk about Pentecost some more, because basically the rest of chapter two is what happens else while on Pentecost. Um, but Pentecost sort of seen as the reversal of the Tower of Babel, right? So, so, so that in Genesis, uh, 
everybody's like, ooh, we can be one people. And as one people, we can be more powerful than God. And we can build this tower and we can reach to heaven and we all speak one language. And God's like, you know, you got really full of yourself and therefore created nations and languages and people. And what we get here is this idea that in the community of Jesus followers, there's this ability, this call, this opportunity to try again, to hit that point where we recognize, and, and why I say try again, um, is because it's still not a good idea for us to think that we all can get along and overpower God. Like, I think if we tried to build a Tower of Babel, we would end up in the same situation again. But I think what we have here is, you know, the whole story of Jesus is that Jesus comes as this, you didn't listen to the prophets, you didn't really understand what was going on. Let me try it again, right? God loved us so much that God put on flesh and joined the party. And we all went, you know that makes a lot of sense and in that we have this opportunity to say right but we have this message of the love of the creator and the reconciliation of all creation with the great creator that we can try again in this sort of beloved community that is meant for more than just who we thought it was right this is the moment particularly for luke it's what you know luke is the sort of gentile social justice gospel this is the it's not even just for jewish people Right? This isn't even just for those people under the law, within the covenant. This is for everybody. Whether or not they are sort of is Israelite, Hebrew, Judean, Christians, or uh, uh, Jews. This is for everybody, um, which is sort of the point of all of, of Luke uh, for, for Jesus' teaching. And I think sort of the point of this, right, sort of in, in that way. And so I just want us to sort of remember all of those things. And what we'll pick up with is this is the reversal of um, the Tower of Babel. And we'll move forward with that a little bit. Um, but I think a very interesting place for us to, um, to sort of leave it. Are there any last um, questions, comments, stories you've heard? Yeah. All right. It starts up, you know, they pick a new apostle. And then the next thing we have is Pentecost. Like, yeah. Two. So and they picked the new apostle, like the day Jesus rose, which is the day he came up. You know, it's like, okay, yeah. what is time wise? And, like, then, and then they hung out. So, so, right. so the idea is Jesus is raised sometime during or shortly after Passover. That's pretty well prescribed. I think the idea that probably the uh, Easter, you know, the Easter day, the, the first day of resurrection was probably shortly after um, the actual end of Passover, right? So Passover is a week. And while the present understanding of Seder was not what Jesus did, right? So please don't ever get confused. If you've ever been part of a church that decided to have a Seder, and called in and took out a Haggadah that's being used by a family today in Judaism. They are doing it wrong because what we think of as a Seder is sort of a medieval creation. So if we think about like the time of Luther is about the time that the present Seder got its roots. That is not what Jesus was doing at all. But keeping Passover, he was doing. Um, but we get the idea that Palm Sunday is the beginning, right? So people were in town to prepare, right? So, so go and ask if there's a place where I might prepare the meal, right? And so we, we have all these ideas of sort of Holy Week being the week of Passover, of which the first two and the last two days are most important. And what we hear in the Gospels is that um, given that the next day was the Sabbath and this one was one of great solemnity, it would imply that sort of it would be Sabbath as the last day of Passover. So Jesus is taken and buried on this day of great solemnity, sort of one of the last days of Passover, also Sabbath, and then rises sort of the first day post Passover. Risen, ascended one day in Luke. And then there's this idea of, well, we, I don't know, what do we do in the meantime? Clearly it wasn't very important to tell the story of. Um, 
I like to think that it sort of was the onboarding orientation for the new employee, right? It, it's sort of the like, hey, Matthias, here's what you need to know. But also the idea that Jesus doesn't give them a time frame, right? Stay here and wait. And without the, there's also this implication that without the Holy Spirit, they weren't going to do anything. They weren't able to do anything. They needed to wait for the gift of the spirit to be able to preach, which they'll do. But then also then when they get into healings and miracles, which will happen next, um, they need the spirit for that. And so in the meantime, it's just sort of this waiting. Why did it take that long? Well, because it did. <laughs> like Jesus ascended, was meeting up with his old friends, took a minute to be like, oh, right, I was supposed to send down... Right, I was supposed to throw the spirit, like, okay, Numa, you're up, right? I mean, it, it took a little bit, um, that's fine. In the meantime, they, they were hanging out in Jerusalem. What exactly happened, clearly it wasn't of much consequence. Um, but it was yeah. also only about 50 okay, days. You know, all this in one day and then, oh, meanwhile, you know. Well, and that's the thing, that's where Luke differs from people like Mark, right? We've talked about Mark and his immediacy. Luke, mm -hmm. eh. Mm -hmm. The other thing, the other thing that's interesting is if you look and if you read Luke with a map next to you, Luke has no idea. It just has no idea because he has Jesus going from here to there to everywhere. You know, oh, they went a Sabbath day's journey and they ended up on the other end of Israel, right? I mean, it's just, Jesus <laughs> just wandering all over. Time and geography are not his strength. At the same time that they are, right? Luke is a historian in that Luke is the one, you know, in those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus, first uh, taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, right? Those things are important, right? He's, he starts out with, in the time of King Herod, when right. so-and-so was governor, right? Time is important in relationship to Rome, because he's uh, part of the, the empire. He's a Gentile. But then you get into this, like, and then, but what happened between this time and that time? Eh, something. And, and that's that, that, that sort of you know, Luke, Luke hop, skips, and jumps his way through the major events. Um, so while it is important for there to be time, it's a different sort of time um, for him. Add something with, for what it's worth. I think the waiting is really important because they're not just doing nothing. It seems to me they're, they're following Jesus's uh, instructions. They're, they're trusting him and they're obeying. And it's hard to do that sometimes when days and days and weeks and weeks go on. So it's not mm -hmm. like they were just twiddling their thumbs. I think they were patiently waiting for the mm -hmm. Lord to do what he said he would do. And that's something that we, we need to do as well. Oh, I think it's I, I think that there is definitely something to the idea that um, you know, that I, I think there's absolutely something for us to think about in the in that realm. Uh, I think we both, I think there's a lot to be said for the trust aspect of that waiting and not the waiting around aspect of that waiting. Mm -hmm. um, because we are post Pentecost people, right? So that if we think of Pentecost as the birth of the church, we fall into the category of those who have now been filled and charged by the Holy Spirit. And I think too often the church is like, well, and we're just going to sit here and wait for Jesus to come back. <laughs> okay. Because, right. I mean, I mean, right. right because we, 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 right. we have this like me and Jesus second coming. I've been baptized. I prayed the sinner's prayer. Right. I mean, and while this right, isn't right. a particularly Lutheran ideal, but, but it's the, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I've received Jesus in my heart. I'm going to go to church every Sunday. That's I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to abstain from everything fun. I'm going to distance myself from anybody I think is wrong. I'm going to, you know, all these things because I'm literally just waiting for Jesus to come back to give me my present so I can float on my own cloud with probably a big wall around it so that I can have own. I mean, I mean, if we're honest, right? I mean, this right. is, this is what too much of the church is doing because we're, because we want to be in that part of the book of Acts. All of that stuff happens in the first chapter. There's right. 28 chapters of, of Acts. One chapter is the waiting around for the spirit. The right. spirit starts with chapter, the very beginning of chapter two is the gift of the spirit and everything else that follows right. is what happens with those filled by the spirit. And that's the part that we have inherited as the people of God. And so that's more where we're at. So I think the idea of trusting in the promises that we have received from Jesus is important. I think the waiting, 
Not as much. I, I think we're we're too com- the the waiting can be very comfortable, and I think <laughs> right. that's not where we're called to be. Right. Um, mm-hmm. gotcha. Boring. Okay. But comfortable. Okay. Gotcha. Um, but but thank you for that. All right, everybody. Well, thank you very much for this. This was fun.